tonight on Reporting Scotland. A former youth footballer alleging sexual abuse by a Rangers coach at Ibrox in the 1980s is told by the club he should direct his complaint to liquidators. We'll have more on the East Coast rail line being brought under public control. The operators are being stripped of their franchise. Also in the programme. STV will close its loss-making STV2 television channel as part of a restructuring plan that will also result in job losses. Why disruption to our body clock could increase the risk to mental health. The people who were relatively protected from adverse mental health problems were those individuals who had a healthy profile of activity during daylight hours and relative inactivity during nighttime. As Celtic's Kieran Tierney attracts interest from Atletico Madrid, scouts are expected to attend the Scottish Cup final at the weekend. Good evening. A former youth footballer who says he was sexually abused by a Rangers youth coach has been told to direct his claim to a firm of liquidators. The coach, Gordon Neely, who's now dead, has been accused of multiple sexual attacks on boys at various clubs. Now, the alleged victim in his 40s believes the club has a moral responsibility to be accountable. Mark Daly's report contains descriptions of abuse that some viewers may find upsetting. How many boys dream of playing football at the highest level like their heroes? This boy, pictured as an 11-year-old with Rangers legends Chris Woods and Ali McCoist, thought he was on his way. I came from a working class family to be invited in your full Rangers tracksuit, shown about the stadium, walking up the marble staircase. It's a huge, huge event for me and my family. David, which is not his real name, trained at Rangers for three years in the late 1980s, but says an encounter with youth coach Gordon Neely would have a terrible and lasting impact on his life. His words are voiced by an actor. I was basically summoned to Gordon Neely's room within the confines of Ibrox. He asked me to lay up on top of like a blue medical table, sort of dark, dark blue. And he started rubbing my thigh, even though my injury was my hamstring. He then asked me to stand up and bend over the medical table and take my shorts down. Did he sexually assault you? He did. I remember lying across the table, looking at a wall, thinking, what's going on here? I've racked my brain for years and years to think, was this a normal thing to do? Obviously, I now know that it's not. As an 11-year-old, basically left to pull your shorts and your pants up and go and do your training over at the Albion football parks, running across Edmondson Drive in tears, thinking, What's just happened? My life basically fell apart that night. Last year, the BBC revealed a catalogue of alleged abuse by Neely at various clubs, but he died in 2014 before facing justice. David, who's a season ticket holder at Ibrox, came forward nearly two years ago, went to a lawyer and was advised to make a claim against Rangers. This email from Rangers lawyers to David's legal team says the club could assist him with accessing counselling services and offers concern, but no apology. It also says... You will understand that there have been many changes affecting Rangers over the last several years. The company which owned Rangers Football Club, which you refer to as owing duties of care to your client, is currently in liquidation. But we do have the liquidator's contact details and can provide that information if it will assist. Legally, Rangers seem to be on a sure footing, but how does that make David feel? Let down, dehumanised. It makes it feel as if you're going through the abuse all again. And although they don't have the same, maybe, liability legally, certainly morally, morally, they're still the same club. When the company that owned Rangers was liquidated in 2012, it sparked endless arguments about whether or not it's a new club and whether it was entitled to hang on to its illustrious history. To many, it was a moot point. They're still called Rangers, the team still plays in blue, and here at Ibrox. But what this situation suggests is that whilst Rangers enjoy the good parts of their legacy, the 54 league titles, for example, some of the bad, potentially more expensive parts, well, that's for the old company.
um, the survivors are looking for the acknowledgement, they're looking for um, communication um, with the football clubs where they were abused. The abuse happened in Rangers Football Club. They are not taking any responsibility and it's as if they're not accountable for it. In a statement, Rangers said, Rangers Football Club will cooperate fully with all those genuinely having an interest in seeking to protect children and address the wrongs of the past. For that reason, we have been in touch with both the Scottish FA and Police Scotland on this matter. We have offered to assist with access to counselling and support. We will not respond to questions that seek to turn allegations of desperate and deplorable conduct from three or more decades ago into cheap and nasty attacks on Rangers Football Club. What I would like to happen would be for someone from Rangers to contact me, invite me over, and I'd like them to sit there and listen to me and realise the impact that it's had and get an apology off them face to face. That's my real goal. Mark Daly, Reporting Scotland. The broadcaster STV is to close its second channel as part of a reorganisation. Nearly 60 jobs are being cut and more will go as part of changes to its news output. The company says the changes will save about £2 million a year. Journalists have threatened strike action. Here's our business and economy editor, Douglas Fraser. News about the news. STV journalists walking out in protest at the job cut announcement. We are horrified and extremely angry at the decisions that will be taken by management and the way that the decisions have been taken and communicated and by the, the lack of information surrounding the announcement that's been made today. STV broadcasts to central and northern Scotland. Only 13 months ago it launched this national digital channel STV2 with a nightly news programme covering Scotland, the UK and the world. But the news operations being slimmed down, broadcast merged with online and social media, out go 34 journalists and production staff. Even though the new channel was run on a shoestring, it's being closed, 25 more jobs cut there. New Chief Executive Simon Pitt says he has a positive vision for STV that will re-establish the company as a creative force. He plans to invest in creative talent, new original programming and digital. STV's new channel was ahead of similar BBC Scotland plans and the shutdown won't help the campaign to bring Channel 4's joint HQ to Clydeside. It's disappointing given what we are seeing is some very promising signs for the media here, especially broadcast media here in Scotland, uh, with the BBC's new channel, with Channel 4 looking to expand out of London, uh, all sorts of demand coming from Netflix and others for production in Scotland. So what's gone wrong and what's the bigger picture? The cost of the STV2 channel to STV was only about a million pounds a year. Now, you, you cannot run a, a dedicated Scottish channel on, on those kind of numbers and expect to, to, to get audiences. There is a, a suspicion uh, within the industry uh, in Scotland that, uh, that the longer term game here is for STV to be sold to ITV. STV is not just a broadcaster and a national institution, it's a commercial firm. And it has, amongst its investors, some who want very much tighter financial discipline and they'll want it quickly. Douglas Fraser, reporting Scotland, STV headquarters in Glasgow. The Prime Minister has insisted the Brexit legislation respects the Scottish Parliament and should go ahead. Theresa May was accused by the SNP of being isolated and out of touch after Holyrood refused to back the EU withdrawal bill. Here's our political correspondent, Nick Kirtley. Dark days for devolution, says the Scottish Government, as Westminster proceeds with Brexit legislation. The UK Government may soon overrule Holyrood for the first time on a bill that impacts devolution. Last night the Scottish Parliament voted against the withdrawal bill. Only the Conservatives backed it, but the Prime Minister insists it is fair. I think this is a reasonable, a sensible way forward. I think it is right that, that we go ahead with measures which not only respect devolution, but also ensure that we maintain the integrity of our common market. Note the PM's words, it is right we go ahead. The SNP say that would be bad for devolution. This is absolutely unprecedented. If this government forces through the legislation, Without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, the Prime Minister will be doing so in the full knowledge that they are breaking the 20-year-old devolution settlement. Both sides say talks will continue, but this bill has nearly completed its parliamentary journey and time is running out fast. 
tonight the House of Lords will finish their scrutiny of the bill and they haven't been afraid of giving the government a bloody nose. They defeated them for the 15th time this afternoon. But none of those defeats have been on devolution. And despite warnings that the Lords wouldn't sign off on this unless it had Holyrood's approval, including some warnings from the Scottish Tories, tonight they will. And it'll do so with the backing of peers whose parties in Scotland refuse to back it. The people in the Welsh Assembly have looked at it in very great detail and they realise, because they are realists, that this is the way forward for both Cardiff uh, and for, for Edinburgh. The Lords have no choice but to pass this legislation and indeed the bill we're sending back to the Commons is infinitely better to the one that we received. But the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government disagree and so a constitutional clash looms. Nick Erdley, reporting Scotland, Westminster. Calmax Managing Director has admitted the current spell of disruption to the company's ferry services is the worst for seven years. The loss of one of its biggest vessels led to issues across the network. But there are also new questions surrounding the latest ferries which are in production, as Ian McInnes reports. It's been far from plain sailing for Calmac over the past few months, with unhappiness in various West Coast communities. In South Sky, feelings are running high. One of the most important things is a ferry service. It's a complete shambles this year. A total shambles. It's like I said, a dominoes. Plumpy, plumpy, plump. What a mess. And that effect has been felt down the pier. The growth in this leather business has stalled, according to its owner, as a result of ferry changes. It's created uncertainty. And I think that's the, the major thing. The uncertainty, not just due to weather, but the, 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 the new the, the type of boats they brought in here, they're not fitted, they're not suited to, to purpose here. Although cars, passengers and ferries are moving, Calmac's own bosses admit this is the worst disruption in seven years. This route between Armadale and Malig is one of those that has been most affected by Calmac's recent disruption as people try to make the crossing over the sea to sky. But we could have chosen almost any West Coast destination where the impact of the disruption has been felt. Growth across our network is about 37% in five years, which is a huge figure and has brought enormous benefits to communities. But what that has done, it means that our fleet is at real stretch. And in the summer, our vessels are 100% deployed, which means that we have no spare capacity. So in the event of disruption, uh, we need to look at how we manage services across the network. In Malig on the mainland, there's further unhappiness. The main problem, I think, is the unreliability and the uncertainty of the timetable. Local hoteliers have told me that they've had, um, last year, a third cancellations. This year, double, that's doubled. So people book and then realise they can't catch the ferry or the ferry times have changed. More vessels are undoubtedly required to meet demand, but there are new questions surrounding those already in production. The MV Glen Sanex was launched on the 21st of November, is far from completion, and the second vessel itself is actually just still in bits at the Ferguson's Yard. It's been highlighted very much lately that there is some concerns about the, the viability of the company continue to deliver that contract. Calmac hope to be able to put this latest disruption behind them within the coming few weeks. But in communities like here in Malig, the major concern is that they're only one breakdown away from a similar loss of vital services in the future. Ian McInnes reporting Scotland in Malig. The East Coast rail line is being taken back into public control. The Perth-based Stagecoach and Virgin trains were awarded an eight-year contract in 2014 to run the Edinburgh to London service, but they've been losing millions of pounds. Well, our transport correspondent David Henderson is at Waverley Station in Edinburgh for us tonight. David, firstly, will this have any impact on travellers? Well, as far as the UK government are concerned, this will have no impact at all on services or staff. So they say that the trains will keep on running, the timetables will not change, and no members of staff are set to lose their jobs. But so it's for them, it's business as usual. But for the, the companies who've been involved in all this, it's been an utter catastrophe. Stagecoach alone, it seems, is set to lose something in the region of £200 million from their entanglement 
in this contract. And to insult to injury, they've been left looking pretty stupid because the UK government have said that it's all their own fault. They bid far too much for this contract. They got their numbers wrong. And the end result is they've had to pay the price. Now, Jackie, the government, needless to say, does not want this to happen again. So whoever takes over this contract in two years' time will have much more control, not just over the trains, but over the rail tracks as well, so that the whole operation, it is hoped, will be run much more smoothly than it has been. Thank you, David Henderson there. A man is due to face court next month, charged with the murder of a 67-year-old man in Aberdeenshire. Brian McCandy was found dead at his cottage near Rothy Norman in March 2016. Stephen Sidebottom is due to face a preliminary hearing at the High Court in Glasgow next month. The Conservative spokesman on rural affairs at Holyrood has resigned after lobbying councillors on a planning application in which he had an interest. Peter Chapman sought support for upgrading the mart at Inverurie. He has shares in the group running the venture. Mr Chapman insists it was a genuine mistake and he doesn't stand to make money. I feel gutted actually because I, you know, I have only the best interests of the North East at heart and that's what I was trying to do and uh, you know, I, feel, I feel sorry that I have to resign but there you are. You're watching Reporting Scotland, it's just after a quarter to seven. A reminder now of tonight's main story. A former youth footballer who says he was sexually abused by a Rangers youth coach has been told to direct his claim to a firm of liquidators. And still to come, the nine-year-old with a rare medical condition who wants her leg amputated. Disruption to the body's internal clock could be linked to an increased risk of conditions such as depression and bipolar disorder. After what's believed to be the biggest study of its kind, scientists are now urging people to become more attuned to the body's natural rhythm, as Rebecca Curran explains. Exercise helps Stuart Gilbert both physically and mentally. Two years ago, late nights working on a supply ship seriously disrupted his body clock. It led to mental health problems and difficulties at work. I, I became irritated very, very quickly um, and uh, had a very short fuse. Um, and yeah, it's purely down to, to, to sleep deprivation and uh, a mix up in. Uh, you know, your, your body clock, you don't know when you're coming or going. It's no secret that being active and taking part in exercise can help boost our mental health. But now a study of more than 90,000 people claims that those of us more active at night could be risking things like depression and bipolar disorder. The pressures of modern life can impact routine. The study found that those who were highly active at night or inactive during the day had a disrupted body clock and they were up to 10% more likely to have been diagnosed with a mood disorder than people who had a more typical pattern. The people who were relatively protected from adverse mental health problems were those individuals who had a healthy profile of activity during daylight hours and relative inactivity during nighttime. So it tells us that the balance of activity during day and inactivity at night is really important and that goes a little bit beyond just sleeping well. Fall asleep so I can read for half an hour. This PhD researcher knows the importance of sleeping well. A recent work trip to Antarctica seriously disrupted her routine. I find that it's much more helpful to go to sleep at the same time and wake up at the same time. You feel refreshed, you feel full of energy and that's missing when you've got to get up in the middle of the night. Uh, for example, when I was on my cruise last month, uh, we had to get up at three o'clock one morning to collect some water and that just set me wrong for the rest of the day. I just couldn't concentrate, I didn't feel very well. The news that a good night's sleep is good for you may not be surprising, but researchers say society is becoming less in tune with that pattern and these results should be a warning to us all. Rebecca Curran, Reporting Scotland, Aberdeen. Each month, 50 tonnes of rubbish are collected from motorways alone in Scotland. And generally, it's claimed litter and fly tipping are the worst they've been for a decade. Well, our environment correspondent has been to see the scale of the problem and what's being done about it. Here's Kevin Keane. Yeah, this is cardboard. We're on a mission to spring clean with a small army of volunteers and plenty of determination. Yeah, I've got a white bag. 
This litter pick at Mackie Academy in Stonehaven is one of dozens taking place during this week of action, collecting all sorts of items across Scotland. Bottles, uh, cardboard, yeah, drink cans, lots of cans. Schools and community groups are involved, but even when an area is freshly cleared, the rubbish quickly begins to return. So how difficult is it to get kids to stop doing all of this? I think it's something that you have to go on at them all the time. It can't be something that's a one-off. You can't just have an assembly and think, right, that's it for the year. I think it has to, they have to be reminded all of the time. These pupils are part of the school's eco-group, so we've decided to help them better understand what happens to the junk. We've brought them to this waste processing plant in Aberdeen to see what can happen to the rubbish they've picked up. Plastic cups. So these can be recycled. If you look at the bottom, it's got the polypropylene, so that's a type of plastic. At this giant plant, up to 20 tonnes of material an hour is sorted into 15 grades of product from paper to plastic, all then able to be sold on and recycled, including the school's litter. It's an eye-opener. What's the most interesting thing that you've learned today that you didn't know before you came in here? And just how much rubbish it actually was. How much machinery is used and how people are used as well. How they separate it with all the scanners, technology. For those who collect litter, the problem is huge. 50 tonnes a month is gathered just from motorways and it's not getting better. The team go out, I think they monitor something like 17,000 sites and we have seen that litter is getting progressively worse. So at the moment, it's at the worst levels that it's been at in the past decade. There is a move to create less single-use plastic, which should help the wider problem. But the concern is that even with the focus firmly on waste and the environment, for many, the message seems not to be getting through. Kevin Keane reporting, Scotland, Aberdeen. In football, the Celtic and Scotland defender Kieran Tierney says it's flattering that some of Europe's biggest clubs are interested in signing him. Atletico Madrid are among the clubs interested and are expected to watch him play in this weekend's Scottish Cup final, as David Curry reports. A cheerleader for Celtic's title-winning celebrations, Kieran Tierney doesn't need a megaphone to attract attention. His performances catching the eye of many a big club. But the 20-year-old is Celtic through and through. I've just been Celtic since I was seven years old. That's who I've played with. I never went and trial with any other teams. I was with my local boys club in Celtic at seven. And since then, it's been Celtic. So to say I can see myself here on my career, yeah, yeah, I can. But you never know in football. What we do know is that Tierney's likely to be in Celtic's team to face Motherwell on Saturday and that Atletico Madrid, who play Marseille in the Europa League final tonight, are likely to be watching him. It's a kind of confidence booster in a way to know that you've put your hard work in and massive teams all over Europe are noticing it. Um, so it doesn't bother me at all, it's, it's flattering as I said. Tierney's under contract with the Scottish champions for another five years and isn't showing any signs of restlessness. I never thought about being away from Celtic. Maybe one day it'll happen, we don't know, it's football. Um, so we'll just need to wait and see, but I'm not, I'm not thinking about that now, it's just thinking about Celtic. Like the rest of his teammates, Scottish football's hottest property is concentrating on winning the Scottish Cup to complete an historic second successive treble. David Curry, reporting Scotland, Glasgow. And Rangers have signed the Scottish international goalkeeper Alan McGregor for the second time. The 36-year-old joins after leaving English side Hull City. A nine-year-old girl with a rare medical condition has decided to have her leg amputated in the hope it will give her a better quality of life. Ruby Hamilton and her family hope having a prosthetic limb will allow her to take part in the sports she loves. Katie Hunter reports. Ruby Hamilton likes to go fast. Dad says if I want to go fast, I scream. But the nine-year-old has a rare condition called proximal femoral focal deficiency and has one leg shorter than the other. She often uses a wheelchair. She's really resilient, she's really determined to be a girl that tries her best, but as time's went on, um, it's less and less that she can do. You know, she wants to do the things that her peers do. She wants to go to gymnastics and dancing, and uh, these are things that she can't do. 
Wales. Ruby's consultant had already discussed the possibility of an amputation with her parents, but Ruby had never shown any interest until she saw this. Paralympic champion Johnny Peacock, performing on Strictly Come Dancing, prompted Ruby to ask about his prosthetic leg. She wanted to find out more. What sport do you want to do? Gymnastics. Gymnastics. As part of the family's research, Ruby met Hannah Morrison, who used to have a serious problem with a bone in her leg. So they did 17 operations trying to rebuild it, but none of them worked. So then at that stage, I got the option when I was six to decide whether I wanted to get my leg amputated or not. And I, at the time, the Paralympics was going on, so I decided that I could saw all these people running, so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. This warrior has courage. Hannah has gone on to star in the CBBC show Raven and loves sport. Ruby's family hope her operation will have a similar outcome. She can basically just have a normal life with it. Um, it's, it's not horrific. It's, it's going to be hard going, isn't it, Ruby? We know that, don't we? I like to do gymnastics, dancing and running. And what do you think of Johnny Peacock? He was amazing. I'm going higher than you. Ruby would love to be able to run like Johnny Peacock and take part in all the other sports she enjoys. Katie Hunter, Reporting Scotland. Now let's get some more sunny weather, hopefully. Christopher? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Jackie. Hello there. Yes, a beautiful day across the country today. Plenty of sunshine, plenty of blue sky and plenty of... Fantastic pictures coming in from our weather watchers. Thank you very much indeed for those. And still a few hours of sunshine to come as we head through the course of this evening. Then overnight it stays dry, but it will be fairly chilly at times. Town and city temperatures down to around 4 or 5 Celsius, but a touch of frost in the countryside. Winds remain light. Tomorrow, and once again, it's a day of high pressure. You can see the high cell sat right overhead, meaning dry and fine fare with lovely spells of sunshine. First thing, a wee bit cool, perhaps the odd shallow mispatch around that quickly goes and then it's dry and fine, plenty of sunshine. Bit of cloud perhaps just drifting around the northern extent of that high and inland, a little bit of fair weather cloud bubbling up at times, but it shouldn't spoil things too much at all. By mid-afternoon, temperatures up to 17 or 18 Celsius inland, always a little bit cooler towards the coast. And north of the central lowlands, around 14 to 16 Celsius. In the sunshine, it's going to feel quite pleasant. Winds generally light, and as I say, any cloud that does bubble up will tend to go away again quite quickly too. The rest of the afternoon into the evening, some lovely spells of evening sunshine and then a dry and chilly night. But notice the thickening cloud across the Western Isles because as we go through towards Friday, high pressure is still with us, but these weather fronts just brushing the northwest, bringing some thicker cloud through the highlands and islands, perhaps the odd spot of light rain from Lewis and Harris up towards Cape Wrath, but elsewhere dry. The best of the prolonged sunshine in the east and even where you see cloud on the chart there, some decent sunny spells coming through. Looking to the weekend, high pressure still with us, but uh, you can't help to fail to notice this weather front pushing in for Sunday. A little bit of rain in the far northwest. So this is how the weekend is looking at the moment. Saturday, dry, some sunshine. Sunday, dry for most, cloudier, with a few outbreaks of rain in the far northwest. That's the forecast for now. Thank you, Christopher. And that's all from us for now. I'm back with the Late Bulletin at 10.30. Join me for that if you can. Until then, good evening.